Now in this reaction, we're going to be looking at the SN1 reaction of this chiral cyclic alkyl halide. So we're going to be looking at the replacement of this bromine with a chloride. So the first step here as an NASN1 or even E1 reaction is to generate a carbocation. Now in this case, by losing bromide, we'll be generating this secondary carbocation. The trick now is to figure out which one, two shifts will occur to generate the final alkyl halide product. Let's consider them one at a time. So in order to figure out which one, two shifts are eligible, we start at the carbocation, the carbon that bears the positive charge, and we count to two until we hit either a hydrogen or an alkyl group. So if I count to two going down, I have one, two, so this methyl group is eligible for a 1-2 shift. If we do that, notice that it skips over one position, it ends up here underneath the ring, and it has created a tertiary carbocation at this position. So we're going from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation, which is energetically favored. Now in the last step, the Cl- comes in, and you'll recall that this carbocation is sp2 hybridized and so it's flat so when the cl minus comes in if it attacks from the top we'll get this bottom structure and if it attacks from the bottom we will get this top structure now we're not going to get exactly 50 50 mixture because there is a difference in the steric hindrance between the top and the bottom specifically from the bottom there's actually a methyl group here that will cause a little bit more steric hindrance. And so we might expect to have a little bit less of this top product between the two. So remember that these are diastereomeric mixtures. Now let's look at the next possibility where we are migrating another methyl group, this time the methyl group that's on the top. It undergoes a one, two shift, again, generating a tertiary carbocation in the same place, but this time the methyl group at the second position is on top. But once again, there is a chance that the Cl- will attack from the top, giving this bottom structure. It could attack from the bottom, giving this top structure. The steric hindrance plays a role exactly like in the last example, and we will probably expect to get a little bit more of this top product, where there's less steric hindrance. So let's move on to the next possible one two shift. So this time we're going to be counting to two going to the top. So I start at the C plus and I go one, two, and I hit this ethyl group. So if this ethyl group undergoes a one two shift, I will end up with a tertiary carbocation at the top position here. And exactly the same principle when the Cl minus comes in, if it comes in from the top, I would end up with this top structure. If it comes in underneath the ring, I would end up with this bottom structure. In this case, the steric hindrance is going to be felt even more strongly because we have an ethyl group in the adjacent position. So we would expect to get more of this bottom product compared to the top one. Let's consider the fourth possible one two shift. So I'm starting from the C plus and I'm counting one, two. In this case, we're going to migrate this methyl group. After having done so, we end up again with a tertiary carbocation at the top position. Same principle here to, to complete the SN1 reaction. If we get attack from the top, we would get this structure. If we attack the, the Cl- from the bottom, we end up with this structure. Making the same argument of steric hindrance, we would expect to get more of an attack from the top position. So we'd expect more of this top product than this bottom product. Now we've done actually the easy to visualize one, two shifts. Let's take a look at two more that are a little bit harder to see. If I start counting from this carbocation, I can count one, two, and I actually see that I hit a carbon that's part of this ring. Just because it's part of a ring doesn't mean that it cannot do a one, two shift. It's just a little bit harder to see what happens. So what I've done here is I have kept all the bonds the same, except that I've removed this bond. As you can see, it's empty here. 
and I have created the bond between this carbon and this carbon. And just as it has for the other four groups, it generates a carbocation. Now this carbocation is also tertiary, and so that would also be a favored one to shift. The difference here is that we've generated a five-membered ring, so we have a ring contraction due to a one-two shift. So what makes this also a little bit more complicated is that we have generated uh, a chiral center at the position adjacent to the carbocation. So when we come in with our Cl minus, even though the Cl minus attacking this position does not create a chiral center, we still end up with a mixture here because of this center here that we created when we did the one-two shift. Finally, we have the most complicated one-two shift. It involves another ring contraction. This time we're counting one, two, so we're going to be migrating this carbon. And just as I did in the previous slide, I am going to delete this bond, and I'm going to create a bond across here. And once again, I've generated a tertiary carbocation. And like the last slide, I have also generated a chiral center on the ring where the carbocation was located. Now, what makes this a little bit more complicated is that when the CL minus attacks, it's actually going to create an additional chiral center. So we have four different possibilities, four different diastereomers. So I can have the chlorine in this position, and I can have the position in the ring with the hydrogen either being on top or being on the bottom. So this would complete all of the possible one, two shifts that are viable because they're leading to a tertiary carbocation. And if you were to do an E1 reaction, it would be even longer because you would have to then generate all of the possible alkenes from these carbocations. But this completes the SN1 reaction.